Our final speaker is Professor Shuran Song. She's a professor at Stanford University. Uh, before that, she was a professor at Columbia University, uh, where since then she has pioneered methods in behavior cloning, notably diffusion policy that many of us are using. Uh, she's the winner of many Best Paper Awards, including the IEEE Transactions and Robotics Best Paper Award. And uh, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Shiran. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, thank you so much for Alberto for giving that great talk. I think that's the best introduction for my talk, actually. So today I'm going to talk about um, how to make robot manipulation as simple as possible, but not simpler. Okay. So to start, I want to show you a robot that I think everybody would love to have at their home. Uh, that is this dishwashing robot. So as you can see in this video, the robot is able to pick up the dishes, wipe off the ketchup, and then it's pretty robust. If you add more ketchup, it's able to continue to wipe it until it's completely clean. Um, and also by the end of it, it's also remembered to cross the faucet. Um, yeah, so I always like to use this example uh, to kind of highlight or illustrate the complexities or difficulties in manipulation. Right? So for example, um, the need that you a uh, robot need to interact with so many complex objects, from deformables to liquids, and also the needs that you need to understand the high-level semantics of the task. Right? So for example, what do you mean by clean and when to stop cleaning? But as you can probably imagine, this example just kind of barely scratches the surface for the complexities or like subtleties for the manipulation task. And if you remember how you uh, wash dishes at night, you probably can remember many more strategies that I haven't listed here. Right, so actually many of those behaviors, just like Alberto said, they are actually really hard for us to describe or in words, not to mention explicitly program them into modules or like programs. Right, so instead, Actually, a lot of those decisions about manipulation, are based, uh, we have made those decisions based on our experience, the context at the moment, and the most important, the physical intuition that we have about the world. So to me, um, really, to teach robot to manipulate objects is to give them the sense of physical intuition that allows us to handle the messy dynamics of the real world. So how I can do that? There are many answers out there, but I think to me, a big part of that answer is actually let our robot to be able to learn from natural human demonstrations. Right? So here, the word natural is very important because first, uh, by making it natural, it make it make all the system or framework accessible to anyone without robotics expertise, therefore making it as simple as possible. Also, at the same time, we want to make sure that the system is still able to capture all the richness and the subtleties of all the real-world skills um, instead of oversimplifying them into pick-and-place actions. And then if we take a quick look on today's message for us to teach robots new skills, I think the to-go message is probably um, robot tally operation. This is just an example from NVIDIA. I'm sure many companies are doing something similar. But I don't know how many of you actually tally up the robot yourself. But if you did, you probably know that tally operational robot is really not natural at all. Right, so for example, it really forced the operator to think and also move like a robot uh, in order to satisfy their physical constraints. And also, even worse, is that the tally operation device oftentimes disconnect the operator from all the rich physical contacts or feedbacks that's happening during the manipulation. Therefore, oftentimes, the operator needs to guess where the contact happens or when it happens from their vision alone. And I think the biggest problem is that tally operation really requires a robot in the loop. And therefore, those systems oftentimes kind of get stuck in the lab environment because of the hardware requirements and also tied to a particular specific robot hardware. So that means that if you change the environment or you update your robot uh, design in your hardware a little bit, you need to recollect all those data. However, if you're just showing your robot a video of you washing dishes, your robot will also have trouble learning, right? Although those data are very easy to get, but it's very hard to learn from. Uh, that is because of a big embodiment gap between human and the robot. At this fact, all, all the developments recently, I think still we have a big gap between the robot hardware and the human capability, especially on their hand. 
So instead, what we are trying to do is to study all the options in between that are trying to kind of tr move towards natural human behavior while still be making the system practical for today's robot hardware. And one of the examples uh, of our earlier time is uh, this uh, work called Universal Manipulation Interface. We like to call this project UMI. So here is how UMI works. Uh, basically, you just hold a, a pair of Hanha gripper, a UMI gripper, and you can basically demonstrate the task you care about. In this case, this dishwashing task I showed you earlier. And in this process, you can move very naturally, and you also directly feel the haptic feedback through the uh, Hanha gripper. And then on this uh, gripper, we actually add um, a GoPro camera to record the visual observations that you can later use to train your robot policy. And we can track the camera motion in 3D in order to recover robot actions in the form of under factor trajectories. And here is a quick um, view for the observations that the robot sees uh, during the uh, demonstration. You can see that from this wrist mount camera view, there's almost no difference between human demonstration data and the robot execution data, therefore minimizing the embodiment gap between these two embodiments. And more importantly, we try to make sure that this hardware interface is shareable across different robot uh, hardwares, uh, such as different uh, robot arms or even quadruped robots. So as long as you have a parallel drop gripper with a wristband camera, you can use UMI to collect data. And then once you have all the data from many different tasks, you can just train a robot policy that's mapped from visual observation to robot action to transfer those skills from human to robot. Right? In many of our work, we, use, we train diffusion policy. And with the same framework, you actually can enable a wide range of applications as long as you can collect the data, like cloth folding, dishwashing, or tossing. In particular, the tossing task is actually a task that's really hard to tally up, even with a very expensive uh, tally option device, because it requires really fast and smooth motion. But now anyone has a handheld gripper like Umi is able to teach uh, the robot this skill. So the next question I want to ask is, can the learned policy generalize? Right, so this is actually a really good question to ask. You should ask yourself uh, very often when you see a video on the internet, because all the demos I have been showing you so far uh, is what we call narrow domain evaluation. So that means that we are evaluating the robot in the same environment that we are collecting the, uh, the training data. And the only thing different is the object initial configurations. So the more important question is whether the robot can still work if you, if you move it into a new environment. And I think that is the question that we care more about. So the short answer uh, is yes, but with a really big if. That is if you can collect enough data to cover all the distributions. Right? So, and uh, what UMI can help us is to make it slightly easier to satisfy this big if. So because UMI is so portable, you can easily carry it around um, to many different environments and collect the training data for your robots for the tasks you care about. And then in this uh, a paper, we actually tested with just in, within 12 person hour, you can collect more than 40, 100 demonstrations over 30 different environments. Imagine dragging your robot to tally up all those, uh, in all these environments will be very difficult, just logistically. And then with all this diverse training data, now you can train a single robot policy that kind of work out of the box in new environment, including the outdoor environments and a water fountain that the robot has never test, uh, trained on. And even better, you can test the exact same manipulation policy on a very different robot embodiment. And in this case, it's a, ro uh, it's a quadruped, a robot dog. So in order to do that, all you need is to train a whole body controller for this particular robot. And this step actually can be completely done in just a simulation without any additional training data from the real world from human. Right? And then with the same whole body controller for this robot, you can enable very complex tasks like tossing objects, uh, but, uh, but still with just UMI demonstration data. OK, so as a part of our, our effort trying to make manipulation as simple as possible for everyone, we try to open source everything, including the hardware design, the algorithms, and we also provide a very detailed tutorial so that you can follow and try to reproduce the system. And we also make UMI uh, very extensible so everyone can build on top of it to improve it based on your application and need. Right? So for example, ever since we released the UMI, like I think, two years, one year ago, uh, we have already seen many follow-up works that try to build on top of UMI and improve. For example, improve the tracking accuracies and the scaling up the data collection, and also many works that try to add new sensor modalities to UMI, like audio data, force data, and tactile data. 
And even recently, new designs for multi-finger dexterous hands that goes beyond the parallel jaw grippers. So for example, uh, in this DexUmi project, what we did is to uh, design a wearable actual skeleton uh, that people can wear and collect data using this device. Right? The, the structure of the actual skeleton is designed to limit the human's finger movement so that the data you collected can be directly mapped to your target robot hand um, immediately without any retargeting. And we also add uh, additional joint encoders on the actual skeleton so that you can record very precise joint space action that can be one-to-one one -one mapped to your uh, robot motor. And we also add tactile sensors to record those contact information during interaction. And then just like Wumi, you can actually still just wear this actual skeleton in your environment, in different environments, and collect the data that you care about. And then it's still very natural, and you can uh, feel the direct haptic feedback in, during the data collection process. And this is just a quick uh, visualization for the learned policy, trained on the data collected by Wumi. On the website, you can see many more examples of uh, this system. And then for this particular task, actually the last step uh, of picking up the salt from the bowl actually turned out to be surprisingly hard, especially if you don't have uh, tactile sensors. It's because for this particular step, actually the vision is quite, uh, it's a little bit occluded. So that's why it kind of highlights the necessity of using tactile sensor. And then if we take a step back and look at all this work, I think one more thing that's very exciting to me is that a lot of this work is actually contributions from the community that is done by researchers and students outside my own lab. And that's exactly what we're trying to build here, a community with a shared and a common platform so that we can share tools, ideas, uh, and data together so that we can make progress together. Um, and as part of the effort to try to facilitate this collaboration, we recently launched this uh, UMI data website where we hope that we can kind of encourage people to put the data together so that we can create a centralized hub for any UMI-related data. And many of the work that I have talked about today actually already have their data uh, here. Actually, all the work that I talked about has data in the website. And if you're also working on something related, you're using UMI to collect data, or you have improvement of UMI, we highly encourage you to reach out to us, and we will list out your work here as well, so that other people can use your data, and you can also use other people's data as well. And then that's the end of my talk, and uh, I would like to thank all my group uh, students, and also thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions if you have time. Okay, questions? Uh, thank you for presenting your great work. I have a question about, um, like for manufacturing, you need to the tasks be very robust, more than 99%. Uh, I, I'm wondering, like, uh, when we use methods like diffusion policy, what do you think is the path toward making them robust enough for manufacturing tasks? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think the simple answer, or well, the short answer, is the path to very high performance is through data. So what typically people do today is what we can call the human dagger, is that you train the policy with a certain amount of data, you roll it out and observe the failure case, and then explicitly collect data for those failure case. And then with that, there's actually no upper bound, like cap, about your performance. You can always improve. You can squeeze out the last bit of performance through that process. But of course, this process is quite tedious that it requires a human in the loop. So I think there are also potentially other methods, like for example, using reinforcement learning in real world to get it to 100%. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very uh, uh, like informative talk. Uh, so yeah, so I think uh, the idea of uh, learning it from a human like, uh, naturally is a very good idea. Uh, however, from, I want to discuss with you if uh, that's the best uh, approach to tie a camera to the end effector. Uh, because, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, I would just watch uh, what the, the robot really sees when uh, an operator is uh, doing the cleaning. I mean, it's really dizzy, like dizzy and, uh, like, I mean, it's daunting for me as an average human. So uh, think about that. Uh, like, uh, we humans, we don't uh, put an eye on our hands. So basically, we, it's more like a, a, like a static uh, point of view from uh, a camera, and then we use uh, uh, sense, like haptics, in, in, including uh, the proper adaptive uh, uh, sense uh, in, our, in our hands and, and limbs to do this work. So basically, we roughly check where our hands are, and then based on the, the feeling of our hands, 
and, and other part of the body to do the work. So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, if the data uh, collected with the camera attached to, to the hands is the best approach, the best data to interpret, uh, the, to learn from, uh, or we want to rely on some other data, including, you know, yeah, so that's a, also a very good question. I think there's like nothing stopped you from adding more cameras. Actually, having the ego centric view is very useful, and uh, you can always add that. You just wear a glass with camera that uh, record all the demonstration data. That's totally doable, and we have some projects actually do that. Uh, that give, give you the global view. But uh, I do also want to highlight that there's a lot of benefits from just using wristbound camera. First of all, you don't need to learn. Like, humans don't need to learn from the wristbound camera. The robot actually learns from it. And they have different learning algorithms that they can deal with with this particular type of camera. And then also, the wristbound camera is very, uh, it's very close to the object that you're actually manipulating, so it provides very detailed view for the task that you care about. And then more importantly, the wristbound camera gives you a lot of invariance. So there's actually a paper like, coming out that will actually tell you that if you use a wristbound camera and a relative trajectory, it, give you, it improves your sample efficiency because of the, the invariance in the data representation. So there's a lot of benefits of using wristbound camera, but it doesn't stop you from using more cameras. And actually, we have a project that used 21 cameras on a robot. That probably will give you better results. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, uh, because of time, we're going to have to wrap it up here. I apologize to the people still waiting to ask questions. Um, I, I would like to thank Shiran and Tamim and Alberto and Professor Hasegawa for such inspiring talks. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I did. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers, uh, particularly uh, Nancy Amato and Seth Hutchinson, for putting the, this session together and uh, giving me the honor of being able to chair it. So please join me in, well, in thanking our speakers one more time.